everyone. Thanks for waiting. We're just waiting for a few more people to come in. So meanwhile, good afternoon to all our participants in Malaysia and the region and good morning to, to all our participants in the UK. I hope everyone is keeping well and safe. I'm Jennifer Lopez, the CEO of the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Malaysia Climate Action Week, co-organized by the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce and British High Commission Kuala Lumpur with the team Race to Zero, keeping up the momentum. So this, this one week digital event aims to highlight the worldwide transition to zero carbon future by bringing together corporate leaders that are demonstrating leadership in tackling climate change. Our distinguished speakers for six webinars over five days this week will undoubtedly leave us with some top provoking ideas and insight on Race to Zero. To start off Malaysia Climate Action Week, we are honored to have with us this afternoon, Mr. Abra A. Anwar, the Chairman of the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, also the Managing Director and the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank Malaysia, Berhad, to give his welcome, in, welcome remarks. Abra, over to you. Yang Bahamad Dato Mansur bin Haji Othman, Deputy Minister of Environment and Water, his Excellency Charles Hay, British High Commissioner to Malaysia. Distinguished panelists and everyone who has tuned in, a very good afternoon to everyone and Assalamu Alaikum wa Wabarakatuh. The British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce would like to extend our warm welcome to everyone for joining us today at our inaugural Malaysia Climate Action Week. Together with the British High Commission, Kuala Lumpur, we are proud to organize this program across five days, covering six important topics that not only touch on just the impacts of climate change, but also more importantly, on how the private sector can play its role to combat climate change. In addition, this week-long program, we will be preceding a very important event taking place in Glasgow, UK, starting next week, the COP26, where governments from over 190 countries will meet to accelerate action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. With COP26 happening next week, and along with the recent announcement by the Honorable Prime Minister during his 12th Malaysia Plan speech that Malaysia is aiming to be carbon neutral earliest by 2050. We believe Malaysia Climate Action Week presents an excellent opportunity to build on the momentum and to highlight climate action initiatives implemented both locally and globally. We are very honored to have Yang Bahamad Dato Mansur, Deputy Minister of Environment and Water, grace and support our event today. While the role of the government is important in setting policy direction, the BMCC also believes that the role of private sector in Malaysia is extremely crucial to support the government in achieving its target. Hence, the program is positioned to be a platform to bring together businesses in Malaysia in order to raise awareness about climate change, exchange ideas of climate actions initiated by both government and industries, share best practices, as well as identify key areas where climate action can be opportunities for businesses to leverage in the near future. In addition to these six webinars, BMCC will be launching the BMCC Climate Action Pledge with the objective of motivating businesses in Malaysia to embark on a journey to establish and implement climate-related goals over the next 12 months. I'm happy to announce that we have already signed up several Malaysian companies even prior to the official launch. And we are truly encouraged by the readiness of businesses to tackle the subject of 
climate action. It's really encouraging, especially for Malaysian businesses that are new to any climate commitments. I would like to take this opportunity to invite them to sign this pledge and start their journey on climate action today. Through our collaboration with UN Global Compact Malaysia and Brunei, we hope to support more businesses in Malaysia to sign the pledge and be leaders and influencers for climate action within their industry and stakeholders network. Before I end, I would also like to convey my gratitude to everyone who contributed towards making Malaysian Climate Action Week a, a, a reality. First, the British High Commission for their support in co-organizing this event. I also want to extend our deepest appreciation to our sponsors, DD, CAP Group, HSBC, ICAEW, IP, Muda Bahad and Smith and Nephew, as well as all 15 of our supporting organizations that came together with a common goal to promote the climate action agenda within their organizations and their stakeholders. Last but not the least, my sincere thanks to our excellent lineup of more than 30 distinguished speakers, panelists, and moderators representing both the public and private sectors as well as civil societies. Thank you for giving your time and energy to the Malaysia Climate Action Week. I'm confident that our concerted effort will spur more conversations between various stakeholders and raise more industry leaders that can champion and advocate for more climate commitments, especially among businesses in Malaysia. I trust by the end of the week, more businesses in Malaysia will take a step or two forward in their climate ambitions and make commitments towards a more sustainable future. Thank you and wishing everyone a very productive five days with the Malaysia Climate Action Week. Thank you, Abra. Thank you for the inspiring speech that sets the scene very nicely to the background of Malaysia Climate Action Week organized by BMCC and the High Commission. You have actually shared with the audience about the objectives and the outcome that we want to achieve from this initiative. Thank you again. Next, we have with us His Excellency Charles Hay, the British High Commissioner to Malaysia to deliver his keynote on Race to Zero, Keeping Up the Momentum. Thank you, Jennifer. Yang Bahomat Dato Mansour bin Haji Othman, Deputy Minister of Environment and Water, Abra Anwar, BMCC Chairman, Stuart Milne, Group General Manager and CEO, HSBC Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, two years ago, when the UK became the President Designate of COP26, less than 30% of the world economy was covered by net zero or carbon neutral commitments. This included the UK as one of the first major economies to legislate for a net zero goal. But today, around 80% of world GDP is covered by carbon neutral or net zero commitments. A newly joining this group, of course, is Malaysia, with the very welcome announcement of a net zero carbon neutral goal announced by the Prime Minister in the context of the 12th Malaysia Plan just a few weeks ago. Now, this all marks a remarkable boost in climate ambition as we look forward to COP26, which starts next week in Glasgow. We expect over 120 heads of government and world leaders to join the COP26 World Leaders Summit, a testament to the growing willingness to act together on climate and to act now. A COP26 will see new action in four priority climate ambition areas the Prime Minister Boris Johnson has summed up as coal, cars, cash and trees. To put an end to new coal, to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles, to scale up finance for developing countries' mitigation and adaptation efforts, and to protect nature's forests, 
and oceans for the climate solutions that they offer. At COP26, the headline pledges on ambition are made by governments. But delivering on this ambition globally, as well as in Malaysia, will require climate action in the real economy. And that is where business comes in as the engine of change. Climate action is not something that we undertake at leisure. The IPCC's report on the physical science of climate change released in August underlines the urgency of action now to avoid the worsening impacts of climate change from extreme heat and rain to crop failures. It highlights the race we're all in to reach net zero emissions by 2050 if we're to keep alive the ambition of below 1.5, which is the goal of the Par Paris Agreement. For businesses, institutions and cities, the UN's Race to Zero campaign provides a global framework for climate action. And it's vital that climate pledges are science-based and backed up by action. The Race to Zero provides a mechanism to ensure that business action is credible. Later in the week, we'll be hearing from Tan Sri Dato Sri Abdul Wahid Omar, the chairman of Bursa Malaysia. Bursa Malaysia is another organization that has indicated a net zero goal and that it will be joining the race to zero. You need to walk before you can run, of course, and not everybody will be ready to commit to net zero just yet. Hence, we also hope that the BMCC Climate Action Pledge can provide a starting point, a moment to commit yourself to understanding your own company's full carbon footprint, to start asking questions of your suppliers and to identify how to upskill your staff and colleagues. And all that will very soon be absolutely core practice for any business in the 21st century. I'm delighted that my colleague Sam Myers, our Deputy Trade Commissioner for ASEAN, will be launching the pledge after opening Thursday's webinar on climate smart cities. Now, I'm sure that you'll also have participated in the business roundtables on net zero that the CEO Action Network and Climate Governance Malaysia have convened over the past few months. Their final roundtable report next month will provide further actionable steps identified by businesses on how to transition the economy towards net zero. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a climate transition to be done. Done well, it's going to be an opportunity to increase market share to take advantage of innovation and to ensure that business activity supports both people and the planet. There's no business to be done in a dead ecosystem. The themes addressed over the course of this Climate Action Week cover many core aspects of this critical transition. The president of COP26, Alok Sharma, has said that COP26 needs to be the moment to consign coal to history. Prime Minister Ismail Sabri reaffirmed Malaysia's no new coal commitment in the recent carbon neutral announcement. So the session on the energy transition is especially relevant, including key players such as Tanaga Nacional, which has also committed itself to net zero. Malaysia has great opportunities in, for example, solar, given the comparative costs, to get ahead of the curve. Cities will be a site of climate action as more and more people live in urban environments but which face the challenges of good health, accessible transport, and affordable housing. Two Malaysian local authorities, Kuala Lumpur and Hang Tua Jaya, have joined the city's race to zero, and I urge more to do so. The pandemic has powerfully reminded us about global supply chains, which link our economies together. But these are also increasingly being greened and are very carbon sensitive. This will be driven through border adjustments, the net zero commitments of your international partners that you buy and sell from, and in all likelihood, increasingly by your competitors. And your customers will increasingly demand it. And on food, there's growing awareness of agriculture's share of global emissions. There's an urgent need to avoid waste and make food systems sustainable. Ladies and gentlemen, the UK has shown how delinking growth from emissions is possible. So we've cut our emissions by 43% since 1990 while growing our economy.
And our next target is to cut these emissions by 78% by 2035 on our way to net zero by 2050. The UK's new net zero strategy identifies the whole of economy actions which are needed to realize this. No sector will be left untouched as investment flows will be guided by this climate transition. To take an example, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has just set a new goal for the UK to fully decarbonize our electricity by 2035. Now, you may have heard about the recent disruptions caused by volatile gas prices in the UK, but this only underlines the priority of continuing to reduce our fossil fuels and to ramp up our investment in innovation and the deployment of green technologies. Earlier this year, the UK also became the latest dialogue partner of ASEAN. In fact, the first new dialogue partner for some 25 years. The UK ASEAN joint ministerial declaration highlighted that in all aspects of this partnership, from financial services to regulatory standards, from infrastructure investment to skills and education, climate cooperation will have a part to play. UK capabilities in green finance and in digital to be delivered through our new digital innovation partnership will under, underpin this new era of opportunity for all. The UK is also working to support Malaysia's climate transition. An important element of this will be our support to strengthening the enabling environment for private sector climate action and investment. Our work in green finance has supported the development of the Malaysian Sustainable Finance Initiative and built regulator capacity on assessing climate risks and disclosures. Our work with city authorities has supported the development of DBKL's 2050 Climate Action Plan, providing a sound basis for its participation in the city's Race to Zero campaign. Our new UK PACT programme, or Partnering for Accelerated Climate Transitions, is working with state governments such as Tringanu on forest conservation and Sarawak on their green economy plans. Ladies and gentlemen, keeping 1.5 degrees alive depends on running the race to zero. The UK is in this race. Malaysia's carbon neutral commitment now also puts it in this race. Will you come and join this race too? Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for the informative speech and some very strong key messages. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honoured now to have with us Yang Merhamad, Dato Mansor Haji Odman, the Deputy Minister from the Ministry of Environment and Water Malaysia, as our guest of honour to officially launch the BMCCBHC Malaysia Climate Action Week 2021. I would like to invite Yang Merhamad, Dato Sri Mansor, to deliver his speech and officially launch Malaysia Climate Action Week. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very good afternoon. Thank you, Miss Jennifer. His Excellency Charles He, British High Commissioner to Malaysia, Mr. Abra E. Anwar, Chairman of the British Mission Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Stuart Mill, Group General Manager and Chief Executive Officer. HSBC Bank Malaysia, distinguished panelists, and all participants with us today. First of all, I would like to express my appreciation to the organizers, the British Nation Chamber of Commerce for Heart, the MCC, and the British High Commission for inviting me to deliver the opening speech and to launch the Malaysian Climate Action Week. As we are all aware, Climate change is a headline topic widely discussed due to its profound impacts on the social economy, environment, as well as the increase in human health issues. The findings of the first working group report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, on 9th August 2021, concluded that the global average temperature has recorded an increase of 1.1 degrees Celsius as compared to pre-industrial level. This phenomenon is due to the increase of greenhouse gas, GHG emissions 
from human activities, which has affected the global climate system and have triggered more extreme weather events. The Malaysian Climate Action Week, which takes place this week, is timely with the 26th Conference of Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC COP26, taking place in Glasgow, Scotland, scheduled to be from 31st October to 12th November 2021. Although the honorable, Right Honourable Prime Minister and the Honourable Minister of Environment and Water are unable to attend the conference, climate change agenda will always be the country's highest priority under the current administration. The government's commitment and serious attention on climate change was evident when the Malaysian Climate Change Action Council, MINCAC, meeting chaired by the Right Honourable Prime Minister, was convened for the second time this year on 11th October. MINCAC is the country's highest platform to deliberate on climate change issues as well as determine the direction of climate change agenda at the federal and state levels. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to inform that Malaysia has successfully updated its nationally determined contributions and DC to the UNFCCC with ambitious target. Malaysia intends to reduce its economy-wide carbon against gross domestic product GDP of 45% in 2030 compared to the 2005 level. The pledge was made unconditional and is 10% higher than our previous target. During the unveiling of the 12th Malaysia Plan on 27 September 2021, the Right Honourable Prime Minister announced that Malaysia aspires to achieve net zero GHG emissions target earliest by 2050. The fulfillment of this target is contingent upon the completion of the long-term low emissions development strategy, LTLS, currently being developed by CASA and is expected to be finalized by the end of 2022. As part of our strategies, the government encourages all ministries, government agencies, and companies in Malaysia to adopt the aspiration of net zero GHG emissions in ensuring the sustainability of the operation of their company. To further support the country's climate change agenda, the government is developing a carbon pricing policy. In line with this initiative, the cabinet meeting on 17 September 2021 had agreed on the proposed International Voluntary Carbon Markets, VCM guidelines, developed by the Ministry of Environment and Water to ensure the country's interest in climate change reporting and GHG emissions reduction commitments will not be compromised. Through this VCM guideline, any party involved must report to CASA information related to the implementation of carbon projects. It is hoped that the VCM guideline will be a source of reference for all stakeholders, including the private sector, who wish to participate in carbon credit trading internationally. In addition, the Malaysian Climate Change Action Council, my CAC meeting on 11th October 2021, also agreed on the development of the domestic voluntary carbon market as a transition to domestic emission trading scheme, DETS. The DETS will be implemented by CASA in collaboration with the Ministry of Finance and Bursa Malaysia. This implementation of this scheme will entail the development of a single platform for carbon credit transactions at the domestic level. The private sector can leverage on debts to undertake carbon credit transactions at the domestic level, and this will also encourage industries transition to low carbon pathways as will attract, as well as to attract more in green investment. Apart from that, debts will also enhance the ability and competitiveness of local products and services in the global market. 
ladies and gentlemen, to support the implementation of the National Climate Change Agenda, the government is strengthening its national climate change governance, among others, through the review of the National Climate Change Policy 2009, development of national climate change legal framework, and establishment of a national GHG center under CASA. The National GHG Center will serve as central entity that will manage GHG inventory related data to increase transparency in national climate change reporting. In this regard, we welcome private sector to contribute input and views in the plan engagement sessions that will be implemented in stages, including capacity building on calculating, monitoring, and reporting of GHG related data. In addition, the government is also implementing and planning for various actions and initiatives that can contribute to the country's nationally determined contribution and DC commitment, such as increasing renewable energy generation, targeting the procurement of 100% of government fleet that are non internal combustion engines, ICE by 2030, maintaining at least 50% of the country's forest cover, promoting zero waste and recycling, and low carbon urban development through the low carbon urban master plan. CASA, as the ministry, also responsible for the country's water management, have mainstream climate change factors in the engineering design of water supply infrastructure systems. Ladies and gentlemen, in line with the Malaysian Climate Action Week, I was also informed that BMCC has launched the BMCC Climate Action Pledge to encourage companies in Malaysia to start taking climate action by improving their company's operating strategies. This is certainly an effort welcomed by the government in line with the whole of nation approach, where the private sector can play a very important role in tackling climate change to reduce GHG emissions in their business operations. In this regard, I call on companies operating in Malaysia to work with the government in taking concrete actions to support us in addressing climate change. Once again, I would like to congratulate the organizers, BMCC and BHC, for the organizing the Malaysian Climate Action Week. Hopefully, this five days program will achieve its goal of raising awareness across various levels of society, especially the private sector, in addressing the impact of climate change. With this regard, I now officially launched the Malaysia Climate Action Week 2021, and I wish all of you a fruitful deliberation. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Merhormat Dato Manso, for taking time off your busy schedule to join us to share some key messages, as well to highlight the many key climate action initiatives and programs that's been undertaken currently by the Malaysian government. And also thank you for launch, officially launching this important Climate Action Week. Thank you, Yang Merhormat. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are proud to have with us HSBC, as one of our climate action partners for the Malaysia Climate Action Week. And we are honored to collaborate with HSBC, a long-standing sterling member of the chamber for today's webinar. Before I pass the session to Stuart, we will have a short video from HSBC now. We all know what's going on. Millions of voices tell us every day. What we need more than ever is action. We need a game plan. We need ideas that deliver a future of sustained prosperity for us all. We need a business plan for the planet. Because business does. Because business solves problems. Business innovates because business acts globally. Business knows the meaning of now. 
business has an eye on the future. At HSBC, we're committing between $750 billion and $1 trillion to drive sustainable transitions over the next nine years and to support our clients all over the planet and their networks to thrive in a low-carbon economy. HSBC's target is for our own operations and supply chain to reach net zero by 2030 and to help all of our customers achieve the same goal by 2050. We believe that business can be part of the solution. If you do too, join us. Visit business.hsbc.com slash bpfp. May I now invite uh, Stuart Mill, the Group General Manager and CEO, CEO of HSBC Malaysia, to deliver his speech. Stuart? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. I'd especially like to thank BMCC for inviting me to speak at this very important event focused on climate action. I think we all know how crucial the drive to a carbon net zero economy is. The Paris Accord set the challenge to achieve this by 2050, and the clock is ticking. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, global surface temperatures will continue to increase and will pass two degrees by 2030 unless deep reductions in emissions occur now. The COP26 conference to be held in the UK next month will be a key moment to lock in the ambitious low carbon policy goals that are so urgently required in all regions. Asian economies need to play a big part in the discussions at COP26 and during the run up, including on issues like setting a price for carbon that will drive a successful and timely transition. Malaysia, of course, is fully committed to being a part of the global transition to a low carbon and eventually carbon neutral society, having committed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030 over 2005 levels. And businesses have a responsibility to accelerate their commitment to green growth to help achieve this goal. This is a matter of resilience and future prosperity. Consumers increasingly consider ESG factors when they buy, and companies need to take this into account. We already see global multinationals incorporating sustainability analysis into their decisions on supply chains and location of manufacturing facilities. It won't be long before regulators in the EU and the US require carbon footprint to be disclosed on product labels. And this will accelerate the drive to reduce carbon emissions in the supply chain, directly impacting companies in Malaysia, which are so integral to global manufacturing. At HSBC, for example, by 2030, all of our suppliers will need to be carbon net zero. The incorporation of ESG analysis into investment decision making too will only grow. Investors are demanding more and higher quality information about company performance, risks and opportunities conventional financial reporting is no longer enough. Now, as a bank, uh, we see our role as being to help finance our customers' transition to a net zero world. We want to work with customers, including those in the most polluting sectors, to reduce emissions and contribute to achieving our common goal. And we've committed up to $1 trillion US trillion of financing and investment by 2030 to help customers get there. By 2050, we've committed to be carbon net zero across our entire business and finance portfolio, meaning that our customers as a portfolio need to be carbon net zero by that date. Most international banks have signed up to similar goals. So this issue is massively urgent and action is required by all of us now working together. Earlier this year, HSBC worked with the United Nations Global Compact Network, Malaysia and Brunei, to organize a CEO roundtable aimed at exchanging best sustainability practices. UNGC and Nottingham University in Malaysia have subsequently distilled discussions from that session into a CEO guide for positive climate actions that provides insights to empower corporate leaders in Malaysia to get started on the road to carbon net zero. Key findings from the guide will be shared for the first time 
here at today's event by Dr. Mohan from the University of Nottingham. So I'd like to thank uh, BMCC once again for inviting me to speak at this meaningful initiative and to all of you for being part of today's event. We look forward to working with your business to meet what Bill Gates has described as the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. As Stuart mentioned, the BMCC is also proud to have put together with the UNGC to host a CEO Climate Action Virtual Roundtable in August 2021. The roundtable was aimed to gather insights and aspiration for leading CEOs as business leaders on how they have been navigating their organizations on a climate positive journey. Insights and the feedback from the discussion was aimed to be used in the production of a digital interactive guide to provide guidance to business leaders who are keen to embark on the climate action journey. So without further ado, may I invite Dr. Mohan V. Awari, the Associate Professor of Strategy and Innovation, Director of Research and Malaysia Lead International Center for Corporate Social Responsibility, Nottingham University Business School, Malaysia, to launch and share with us Insights to Malaysian Businesses for Positive Climate Action, a CEO guide. Dr. Mohan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to start with uh, thanks to a few people, starting with yourself, Jennifer. Thank you for having me here. Um, Mr. Abrar Anwar, BMCC Chairman and uh, MD and CEO of Standard Charter. Uh, my distinguished three speakers, um, Young Barbagya Dato Mansur Othman, uh, His Excellency Charles Hay, Mr. Stuart Milne, but I also have to thank a very important person in the uh, platform today, Faroz Nader, the Executive Director of uh, UN Global Compact Malaysia. And uh, it's this gentleman who's brought together civic society, government, academia, and private sector, uh, and has been making, shaking things up in the last one year, right? Um, it's a bit cliche, but I'm opening up my PowerPoint. Uh, as an academic, I actually don't like doing this, but uh, it's too important a session not to have these. So I've, I've titled this as a backstory and snippets uh, before we actually launch the guide because there's a build up to this event over the last one year. Uh, I don't have to say much. The distinguished speakers before have set the tone from a regulatory point of view, finance industry point of view, and also private sector point of view. And BMCC and uh, UNGCMY as part of the uh, civic society have also been doing their, their bits. Right. So there are fantastic organizations and it's fascinating to see the change taking place all over the world and in Malaysia, investors, markets, businesses, and I'm happy to say the academics and civic society too. This is the backstory, right? Uh, UN Global Compact Malaysia, uh, Faroz Nader has uh, stimulated it over the last two years and I like the terms he has used on emphasis of collaboration and innovation and hence I'm building this little backstory. The business school where I come from uh, is a UN prime champion school, so we've been championing responsible management education. So it was a pleasure and privilege to work with GCMYB and multiple businesses in the round tables. And this is how it happened. So last August, and it's all during the pandemic uh, that Faro started certain initiatives. It was the series of round tables, field interviews with CEOs of companies in Malaysia. This was done because it was important to note that every country or every institutional setup has a different starting point to any initiatives, particularly sustainability. So the field work was very interesting and that led us to uh, it culminating in the sustainability guide for Malaysian businesses. It was meant to be an easy guide for Malaysian CEOs to kickstart their journey into overall sustainability. This later led to an even more interesting guide with three components. Right? So there was the uh, bit about embarking on low carbon or net zero pathway with lots of analysis on physical and transitional risks. Again, this was led by UNGCMYB in collaboration with Tata Consulting Services, Central College, and uh, ourselves. There's a total climate management framework for decarbonization and very interesting localized case studies. Uh, it would look like a no-brainer that any climate action should be the same for all, but different companies, different sectors have different ways of approaching this. And these four case studies give you beautiful stories of uh, Malaysian companies and their journeys of climate action. And that's how this came to the CEO guide. While operationally the guide was very useful, it was felt that uh, if a CEO has to start taking a decision, where would he start or where would she start? And then this led to their uh, round tables, one with the uh, British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, 
one with TCS, one with the German Malaysia Chamber of Commerce, and one with HSBC Malaysia. So my thanks to all of them, and of course to Global Compact Malaysia and Brunei again, for bringing all these people together. And then we had an opportunity to distill the various outcomes of these sessions. I'd like to share a few snippets only today, uh, not too much, but the guide itself looks like this. We started with always looking at the starting thoughts, and it's very interesting how the different CEOs had different views, but also there were certain common ideas, right? We also put together the five questions that the UN Global Compact has put together for SDG leadership and very specifically for the organization's climate agenda. So all CEOs and leaders or the company representatives, please ensure that your CEOs actually have a look at these questions and reflect on themselves. And then we get on to the starting thoughts, a little bit of the embedding of the climate action into business strategy, what seemed to be a very technical issue or a science and engineering issue has a very interesting business take. And more importantly, uh, in the context of strategy, we, we all know that implementation is even more important. Uh, and in implementation, we start looking at the organizational structures or how does a company organize uh, as it moves towards a net zero carbon company. And a quick snippet of their uh, advice or a quick advice and some seven steps culmination, right? We've also put together some, uh, some links where you can draw on the resources quickly. So here are some snippets. Uh, I'm calling them snippets because I'd like you to read the guide, obviously. And this was one of the most fascinating snippet. I say it's fascinating because organizations are structured so interestingly and uh, several CEOs gave how they approached it and how to implement it. So in a simple way, one of the companies said, instead of restarting a division or starting a new division, they just handed it over to the quality function. The philosophy of a quality function to be improved and continuously improve on certain processes and sustainability was embedded in it. So in the organization structure or implementation page, you'll have uh, various ideas from different CEOs on this kind of an issue. Here are some interesting starting points. Some people thought of it as a multiplier risk. So you need to take care of those things. Some look at it from the point of view of relationship to the stock markets and share prices and how that should drive or uh, you should get the people to drive climate action. Uh, many CEOs started talking about attracting talent. Uh, this was quite a surprise that even climate action is uh, very attractive to the younger people. A combination of pull and uh, push factors would be important and KPIs, as much as I don't like them, uh, seem to be very critical and interesting KPIs were noted. Obviously, this is a collaborative uh, approach. Uh, nobody can do this alone. This is becoming a commonplace thing and nothing surprising. But here are some examples of companies working with other organizations, with suppliers, or even civic society in terms of managing one aspect of the climate action to waste. Uh, some other points include these, getting the employee buy-ins. Very interestingly, this has become the discussion in many a forum, the younger generation, be they your employees, be they your consumers, how do you start getting them involved, getting the buy-in? One of the CEOs actually mentioned that if you focus fully on the younger generation, it automatically percolates apparently to the older groups. Um, I'm an older group person and I'm curious to see how the youngers would drive me. And then I reflect at home and realize the kids do drive my purchasing intentions and also the kind of things we invest in these days. And there's quite a bit of a reaction from the 17 and 19 year olds. So if the 28 and 29 year olds in your companies are getting the buy-in, apparently the whole company can come together, right? The data obviously is very important. How do you develop systems? How do you develop frameworks to capture this data? Or would you look, look, like to go on to common frameworks and systems, thoughts to come about? And finally, this was the very interesting thing. Rather than complain that somebody is not doing anything, uh, quite a few CEOs talked about how do you engage with the government, whether it's through an advocacy department or supporting the government uh, in terms of climate action in various ways that you can. Right? So here are some snippets uh, that I'd like to stop with. And then this is where we'd like to launch the guide. Uh, this is the link for the guide. I'm not going to click on it, but I'll make it a little shortcut launch. And this is how the guide looks. So it's a pleasure now to unveil the guide titled Malaysian Businesses for Positive Climate Action, a CEO's guide. Again, this is not meant to be the answer to all solutions, but it's CEOs of rather large companies, medium-sized companies, local companies, companies operating in Malaysia and their thoughts to help leaders to get onto the climate action agenda and towards your net zero aspirations. Um, I'll stop now and thank you all for giving this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Thank you for introducing the, and officially launching the guide. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at the BMCC and also the British High Commission, we just do not want to raise awareness and highlight the impact of climate action 
week on climate change impact to the businesses. However, we would like to support companies in the implementation of your climate action journey. That is why, hence, we are pleased to be working with partners such as UNGC and the Nottingham Business School to support companies that would like to start the climate action journey so that, so that you know, it just doesn't stop in a, in, at a point of raising awareness, but there is a continuity in terms of uh, supporting organizations with a climate action journey. So with that, uh, we will now move on to our panel session. But before moving on to the panel session, a quick housekeeping rule before we begin our panel session. We do encourage all the audience to raise questions to the panelists. We Please ask your questions using the Q&A chat feature at the bottom of your screens. There will, also, there will also be a feedback form later given in the chat box during the session. We appreciate your views very much, so kindly complete it. Now, moving on to our panel session, the title of our panel session for this afternoon is Incorporating ESG into your business. We have a distinguished panel with us this afternoon, Dato Azmi Merikan, Group Managing Director of Sun Dhabi Property, Raja Azmi Shah, the CEO of HSBC Amana Malaysia Burhat, Dato Kama Khaled, the Chief Corporate and Transformation Officer, Southcom Aziata Burhat. And we are delighted to have Peter Faroz Nada, the Executive Director of UNGC Malaysia and Brunei Network, as the moderator for the session. But before I hand over the session to Faroz, please uh, let me give you a quick background about our distinguished moderator this afternoon. Faroz is an experienced corporate sustainability practitioner, having led projects that have been featured at national and Fortune 500 company sustainability documents. He provides advisory and insights for various private sector, government and UN agencies on SDG and corporate sustainability matters. Serving as Executive Director of UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Bruna, he is developing various strategic programs and digital tools to accelerate private sector SDG performance. May I have all the panelists and the moderator on your cameras, please? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jen. Uh, Assalamualaikum and uh, good morning and afternoon to all. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for the first panel uh, of, of the Malaysia Climate Action Week. Uh, I take this opportunity to congratulate uh, friends at the British High Commission, and of course BMCC uh, for organizing this program, uh, which would have significant impact in pushing the climate action needle. Uh, we at UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei are proud to be a supporting uh, partner. Now with sustainable trade, becoming the new mega trend. Uh, there is growing demand for corporates and also SMEs uh, to be able to embed and position ESG practices and impact as part of their business value add. Failure to do so will mean devastating social environmental impact as highlighted in the most recent IPCC report. Now to further contextualize cost of inaction, uh, a report by Standard Chartered has highlighted the potential loss of $65 billion by 2025 in export revenue if Malaysian exporters do not meet global buyers' climate aspirations. In another report by Deloitte, highlights that ASEAN as a region, we stand to lose $28 trillion within our collective economies by 2050 if we do not take serious actions on ESG risk and challenges. Now, to help us navigate this fast-moving and evolving subject, for this panel, we have the privilege to learn from and engage with three seasoned corporate and sustainability captains on the topic of incorporating ESG practices into your business. So please do join me in welcoming uh, Dato Azmir Merikan, uh, who is the Group Managing Director of Sain Dhabi Property Berhad, one of the largest and most established property companies in Malaysia with decades of pioneering experience in residential, industrial, and commercial developments. Dato Azmir has a wealth of cross-functional experience from his background in corporate advisory and as a senior business leader. He was previously the Managing Director uh, and CEO of uh, UM Agenda Berhad, one of the largest asset management and infrastructure solutions companies in Asia x China. He led the merger and acquisition as well as integration of five companies involved in healthcare services, infrastructure, real estate, and consultancy with operations in Malaysia, Singapore, UAE, India, Indonesia, Taiwan, New Zealand, and Australia, 
as part of the creation of UEM Agenda Berhad. He started his career uh, as an investment analyst with Maybank Group and later worked as a manager uh, in the financial advisory arm of PwC. He then joined CIMB Investment Bank Berhad and was part of the team that established the bank's private equity business. He holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from Hayward College of Business, Western Michigan Uni University of the United States of America. Our second panelist is Datuk Kamal Khalid, uh, who is the Chief Corporate and Transformation Officer of Selcom Adziata Berhad. At Selcom, uh, Datuk Kamal provides leadership to the various corporate functions, including legal, regulatory, social development, sustainability, enterprise data governance, and program management. Datuk Kamal brings with him 25 years of experience and previously, previously served as the Group Managing Director for Media Prima Berhad. He was also formerly the Head of Communications for the Prime Minister. Datuk Kamal received his education in MRSMOA and received a Bachelor's of Law degree from the University of Nottingham before beginning in corporate finance with Bumi Putra Merchant Bankers. He then worked in various companies involved in technology and venture financing before joining Bursa uh, in, uh, in 1998. And last but definitely not least, uh, we have Raja Amir, who is the Chief Executive Officer of HSBC Amana Malaysia Berhad. And he is responsible for executing the HSBC Group Strategy for Islamic Banking in Malaysia, driving sustainable leadership and value-based intermediation efforts while spearheading the development of talent, particularly in relation to Islamic finance and sustainability within the group. Now, prior to his appointment, Raja Amir was the head of Debt Capitals Markets Malaysia. He has made many material contributions to the development of the international and Malaysian supermarket. And more recently, Raja Amir led the government of Malaysia's US um, 800 million sustainability sukuk, being the world's first ever sustainability sukuk by a sovereign. He started his career in London in the tech industry with One and One Limited and moved to RHB Investment Bank uh, in 2006. Thereafter, he joined HSBC Amana in 2010 and has seen, since held various roles within the International Currency Business Unit and Debt Capital Markets team. Throughout his, his time with the Debt Capital Markets team, HSBC has been constantly awarded the best bond house globally by Asset AAA Country Awards. Uh, and Raja Ame is also in charge of delivering Project Cocoon, an initiative to transform HSBC Amana into HSBC's group's first sustainable bank by the end of 2022. Now, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us uh, today. Now, before I hand over to the panelists for their sharing, I'd like to brief our audience on our panel discussion structure. So we will start out with opening remarks by each panelist. Uh, followed by a group discussion and of course building questions from the floor so do share your questions in the q a box uh, and i'll do my best to get them answered by our esteemed uh, panelists now with that uh, may i call upon dr asmir merican to kick start us and share his opening remarks dr asmir over to you sure Baris, thank you uh, thanks uh, so much for having me and uh, hello again to you and to everybody out there as well as uh, hello to the panelists uh, okay, just very quickly, I'm just going to go through a little bit about Sign Up Property uh, and, and what do we do. I uh, won't bore you with too much details. Uh, uh, can I, uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, next one. And the next one, yes. So, uh, very quickly, uh, Sign Up Property is, uh, is about 48 years old. Uh, and we've, uh, we are the pioneer of townships in Malaysia. We've built uh, over 100,000 homes as a master developer, um, the largest builder of, of uh, landed homes in Malaysia. Uh, we're also a leader in sustainability, something we've been involved in, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, so generally, uh, the way we work is we are a master developer. We open up uh, townships. Uh, you, uh, some of you may know, uh, for example, Subanjaya, which is our, one of our, the earliest townships in Malaysia. So right now we've got 24 active townships across uh, West Malaysia. And we also have a project in the UK, which is the Battersea Power Station together with SP Satya and the EPF. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, quick note on our shareholding. Uh, so we are uh, owned, we are owned by many institutions, uh, and PNB being the, the our majority shareholder. Next. Yeah, so these uh, are examples of what we do. We have three main uh, sectors, uh, by far and, and the largest is property development. Uh, we've got some commercial uh, buildings as well. And, and a new, uh, newer, I guess, 
uh, interesting uh, sector now is the industrial. So we we are uh, you know uh, uh, growing that uh, very very aggressively. That's a, a again a, a, a great new sector for us and you know we are uh, really uh, uh, we have attractive land banks which uh, we're focusing on growing the sector next um so very recently uh, we announced a deal with logos which is, is to build large-scale uh, warehouses and this is to attract foreign uh, investors in to uh, use malaysia uh, as a hub uh, for their uh, warehousing needs um under our investment asset management uh, business, we also own uh, and operate um, uh, malls and, and we, some retail businesses. We have a, a, a leisure business. Uh, primarily, it's a KLGCC, uh, Kuala Lumpur Golf and Country Club. Um, um, those of you who golf will definitely know that. And we've got Saim Dhabi Convention Center. Yeah. So uh, that's... Prime, uh, it's about the, what we do here. Next slide is awards. So I'll skip that. But uh, you know we've uh, we've uh, you know uh, done quite well, I guess, in this sector. Well, uh, I don't have to go through. Next one is uh, yes, the topic here, which is sustainability. Next. So I think this is most important, and I think you know for Sun W Property, uh, uh, we are fortunate that we started the sustainability journey uh, quite early, being part of Sun W Group. Uh, then, and uh, that was in two thousand and seven when we uh, looked at uh, what we would do in the sustainability sector. Um, very early on, we uh, um, we had uh, what we call the Idea House, which is the first. Uh, uh, certified carbon neut neutral residential building in Southeast Asia, uh, and 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 uh, uh, that led us to many learnings. Uh, we've uh, uh, we've won many awards from that. We've launched uh, the Elmina Township, which won an award last year for the most sustainable uh, uh, township de uh, development, um, and we continue on this journey where we've uh, learned. Quite a bit. I've done quite a lot of activity, uh, such as carbon disclosure, uh, tree planting. Uh, we've also launched a sustainability uh, suku, uh, and, and and this is something that you know uh, uh, we'll you know, be talking more about today. Yeah. Next. Yep. So these are some of the reporting that we do uh, for our uh, sustainability uh, uh, reporting. Yeah, that's it really. That's the uh, quick intro on, on some W property and, uh, and some background on sustainability. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asmir. Uh, if I can just uh, pose a follow-up question. Um, yep. So, yep. so SDP ha has published its 2030 uh, sustainability yep. goals uh, agenda, you know, which compromises of various goals that support the yep. SDGs. Uh, but also by providing quantifiable benchmarks that benefits all stakeholders. Could you perhaps share uh, what are the things your companies will, uh, will do differently now or in the coming years to achieve uh, the targets that you set? Uh, okay. Uh, I, I think, you know, one of the things that we've learned is that we've, uh, we want to work with a formula that works, right? And if you, if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, sustainability today and how to go forward, uh, and and if you look at the uh, you know what we want to do our, un, under our sustainability goals, uh, first things first is that we want to work with communities. We've seen this having impact. Uh, you know it, it, the, the results were, in fact, quite heartwarming. So so you know uh, we had a, a project where we did uh, we worked on urban farms uh, within our township to establish how we work with communities. Uh, communities were able to get fresh produce. Uh, they didn't, didn't need to travel very far. Uh, we worked on community recycling, uh, which also, uh, you know, uh, was something that was very well received. Uh, this is not just uh, asking vendors to recycle, uh, but we actually uh, engage the residents actively so that residents participate and, 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 and also um, are aware of uh, recycling or not. So I think those, those things really uh, things that can happen on the ground, it will uh, people uh, I think uh, understand, and there's a lot of, uh, especially today, right? People want to get involved. They want to contribute and they want to do better, right? And this allows uh, the community where we, and we have a lot of townships to really participate. So I think this does really really well. 
The second one, I think, which we will have impact is on um, biodiversity. Uh, this is something that the organization, like us, you know, we, I mean, to be really honest, you know, uh, a property developer is not really sustainable. But we we cut down trees and build homes, so it's, it's it's problematic. But you know we have to get around this, and how do we do this? Uh, and and one of the best things that we've seen that uh, uh, that uh, get results is that uh, to to educate. And when when I talk about educating, uh, I'm going to give an example of our uh, our rainforest uh, knowledge center, which was set up in in Elmina, right? Um, and we work with NGOs, uh, the uh, Tropical Rainforest and Conservation uh, Research Center, PRCRC. Uh, what we do is educate the community. Uh, we, we, we want to, and we're just beginning with this activity, right? Um, so uh, people understand uh, and learn from young uh, why biodiversity is important. And, and it's just not planting ornamental trees, it's planting trees that you know, help reduce carbon footprint. Uh, you know, we uh, cultivate nurseries, uh, we, we run programs that you know, children understand uh, uh, and, and appreciate biodiversity. I think if, if you catch it really early and you, you root these things down, I think you have a generation that really appreciates nature. I think that's something that we feel that is important and we want to do that. Uh, the third one, I think, which is uh, a challenging one, um, is really looking at our business and talking about how do we decarbonize uh, and how do we decarbonize our own operation. So, you know, and, and really there's two parts of this, right? One is the, 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 the carbon that we generate in our operations, right? The other one is the carbon that comes from the entire value chain. Cement being transported, steel bars being transported, being manufactured. So these are embodied carbon, which is a bit more difficult, and we're doing a lot of work to understand this. Today, if you look at our own operations, the biggest emission is uh, diesel emissions. For example, we do earthworks. Uh, you know, so that's that that is is something that we know. Uh, personally, I believe that you know behaviors change when you make data available, when you make it right in front and center that people understand what they do is contributing to, to, to emissions, for example, right? And I, I've used this example before. Uh, 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 you, you've you heard it, but I, was, I call it the Prius effect because when the Toyota Prius just came out, yeah. drivers actually modify behavior when they see how efficient they were driving, right? right? And I think, you know, what we're trying to do is maybe, you know, just do a meter uh, that, you know, you know, that shows e even the, the, the truck driver or the, you know, tractor driver, how, 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 how they're consuming uh, diesel. And, and, and I think this, uh, this is something that we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at um, converting some of our assets uh, to use renew, new, renewable energy. Uh, and instead of pulling it from the grid, so we've identified two assets, uh, our, 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 our golf club being one and our, our international sales gallery. Uh, there are harder issues that needs the whole industry to be involved. Uh, for example, uh, uh, green cement. So this will need cooperation for many parties, right? More R&D, uh, governmental uh, you know, encouragement, uh, incentives. Uh, prefabrication, where you look at, you know, uh, you know, doing more stuff, as, as assembly, and and you know, and there's opportunity to cut down uh, even labor. So these are these are a lot of things. This, this kind of things that we're looking at when we talk about decarbonizing our own operations. I have two more. One is being the the fourth one is being socially responsible organization, um, and I, I think that's that's that is one of the. Uh, uh, things uh, that uh, we've seen uh, having the most impact. Uh, we've run programs, uh, empowerment programs uh, involving the B40. Uh, I go again to the fact that we, we, we had community farms. We've, we teach the community and how to, how to uh, you know, uh, uh, plant chili. And then, uh, and, and believe it or not, ch you know, chili is not <laughs> not as widely available as right. you and I may think. 
and, and you know and getting into the market you know and, and selling it it, it produces results uh, to the to the community right and and, uh, and for us that's um, uh, you know you know it, it's a direct impact and the, and the last one is i think being being socially uh, socially uh, uh, responsible you know we want to know we make a difference we want to be a force for good so using the, the, you know what we have to make a positive impact uh, on, on the environment. Thank you, Dr. Asmeh, for the insightful sharing. I'd like to turn our attention now to uh, Dr. Kamal uh, to share his uh, opening remarks and thoughts as well. Dr. Kamal? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Feroz. Uh, can you hear me? Just a quick sound check. Yes, yes, can hear you, okay. yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, alaikum. good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to see a familiar face in the panel, uh, Dr. Asmeh. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um, it uh, yeah so so I, I I don't have a presentation but let me just very quickly uh, state a couple of of uh, of facts uh, regarding uh, SACOM and and the Agjata group of which we are part uh, and then then perhaps uh, you know maybe that leaves a little bit of time to uh, take questions and and um, and other queries so so SACOM is uh, as as many people probably know is a is a fully owned subsidiary of the Agjata group um, which it has a footprint. Uh, throughout uh, parts of uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia. Uh, Salcom in particular, we are the oldest private uh, telecommunications company in Asia. We have over 9,000 subscribers. Uh, we have the largest uh, mobile network in the country. Uh, and, and this puts us in uh, quite an interesting position because of the reach uh, and the, um, and this, the kind of the, the daily connections that we have uh, with our subscriber base uh, puts us in a position of power, but also of, of great responsibility. Uh, now, specifically, when we speak about sustainability, there are two uh, sustainable development goals that we officially uh, adopt. Uh, one is education, that's SDG 4, and the other is SDG 13, uh, which is uh, climate change. Um, and, and climate change really is part of a bigger initiative of our International Trade Association, the DSMA, that have set out a number of targets in order for us to get to net zero by 2050. Uh, so just, just uh, I know this is climate action week, so I'll speak a little bit about the climate bit, but, but I think it also behooves me to speak a little bit about SDG4 uh, because that's, we do quite a lot of work in that. Um, you know, I think we, we take um, our position in society quite seriously uh, and the responsibility that we carry. Uh, and SDG4 is on education, but we also support a lot of other sustainable development goals indirectly. Uh, for example, uh, inequality, for example, uh, providing um, uh, better work opportunities, economic growth, uh, because uh, there is, I mean, the, the, the truth of the matter is that there are two big challenges, I think, that we face in Malaysia, uh, which, are, which is being uh, addressed by the government. Uh, number one is connectivity. Connectivity is, is still quite patchy in a number of areas. Uh, and the second thing is the digital divide, uh, where, where we have uh, the country, especially after the effects of COVID-19, uh, you see that, uh, that digital uh, enablement, I think, is a critical part of everyday life. Uh, and, and if you don't have connectivity and you don't have access to digital tools, uh, then you'll have a, a, a large portion of the country being left behind. And this is, you know, this leads to stratification, it leads to a bigger uh, um, a gap uh, in society. So, so that's one of the things that we do. And, and specifically uh, in education, we do a lot of work around the B40 for education, providing free device, uh, uh, subsidized devices, uh, free connectivity. Uh, we provide, um, we have this thing called the uh, Siswa Mall and Desa Mall, which is uh, providing an, a digital marketplace for marginalized um, uh, groups. Uh, such as B40 students and, and rural housewives to be able to connect uh, uh, to the uh, e-commerce universe. Uh, so there's a lot of work that we do on that. But turning out to SDG 13, specifically on climate action, uh, yes, so this is, this is an issue <laughs> because uh, the telecommunication sector uh, actually uh, is, uh, consumes quite a lot of power. Uh, actually, just to give context to everybody, um, we, we aren't, I mean, nobody's really an angel in this space. I mean, there's work for everyone to do in order to become uh, more sustainable. But, but the ICT industry, which is the, the greater grouping to which we belong, actually contributes to about two, to just over 2% of carbon emissions globally, right? 
and, and the telecommunication sector uh, out of that 2%, about a third of that is accounted for by the telecommunication sector. So we, we account for about 0 0.7, 0.8% of total carbon emissions across the different industries. Um, but, you know, you would argue that's still too much, right? Uh, hence the need to get to net zero, because uh, I think the, the, the big challenge of, of, uh, of um, decarbonization, actually, it is something that everybody needs to do together. Uh, and and I, I don't think there's any part too small uh, to contribute to, to the effort. So specifically for us, uh, our biggest um, sources uh, of, uh, of uh, our carbon footprint uh, are obviously our, it's our hardware, right? So it's our, it's our, our network, our towers, um, our core, uh, that accounts collectively, I think that accounts for about 75%, 70-75% of total emissions. And then, and then our other premises, our headquarters and our, our, our team. So uh, for us, the big challenge actually is, is uh, uh, adoption of more renewable energy, especially for uh, the parts of our business that suck a lot of energy, uh, and then energy efficiency, right? So those are the two things that we're starting with. Uh, but obviously, I think uh, I, I won't. Sorry, I won't go too much. Uh, probably taking about too much time. But just to echo something which Jato Azmi said, you know, a, a property developer is responsible for quite a lot of unsustainable practices. But if you look at it as part of a broader value chain, then then the the, the, the magnitude and the scale of the problem becomes much much larger, right? And, and it's a similar thing for our industry because actually, if you look at the total value chain, if I'm not mistaken, the the biggest single um, uh, what do you call it again, uh, uh, source of, of emissions is actually the life cycle of the devices that people use that, that ride on our network. It's, it's not that, so we, it's, a, it's a scope three problem, if you will, right? Um, and, and, uh, and that really needs to be tackled uh, holistically. Um, but for us, I think as a start, I think energy efficiency and energy consumption is probably the first, it's the most um, it is the most uh, uh, significant thing, I think, and the quickest thing that we can tackle. Uh, so we're starting there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamal. Um, just to, to continue to pick your thoughts, um, I would like to pose a question. Now, with Malaysia having a mobile penetration rate of more than uh, 145%, right, means that the, the, the telco industry has access to a, to a large population base here in Malaysia. Um, you know, that also provides opportunities to engage with people from every level of society. So how is Cellcom taking advantage of this uh, penetration opportunity to incorporate the values of ESG into your operations and also maybe even to raise awareness of ESG mm -hmm. and its values to your customers? Right. For, so for us, uh, thanks. That's a good question, Feroz. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think that speaks to, uh, you know, the position we find ourselves in the corporate landscape as well as the role that we play in society. Um, I think for us, uh, a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the messaging and a lot of the our engagement as far as broader society is concerned, I have to admit, uh, has to do with things like bridging the digital divide uh, and providing education uh, uh, education opportunities, providing the tools for people to connect to the digital ecosystem. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think. I would actually flip that question around and, and look at it as how our customer base actually informs what we do. Because I think as uh, um, uh, I was listening to, to Dr. Mohan speak earlier, for example, uh, and it is very, very clear that uh, not so much in, in our generation, which is aging or aged, <laughs> depending on your perspective, but, but if you look at uh, the generations that come after us, sustainability is becoming more and more of an important issue. Uh, and, 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 and people actually make life choices guided by sustainability, right? Uh, so I think it's a, it's a good opportunity for us to get ahead of the curve a little bit and, and make sure that we act in a responsible and sustainable manner uh, so that we connect and resonate with that a bulk of that 9 million customers that I spoke about earlier. Um, over and above that, I think uh, it, it is. Uh, it is. Um, uh, I think it's just. It's just good practice. I think uh, as and when uh, uh, people become more aware of the issue, and it is happening. You know, with with uh, COP twenty six happening at the moment. Uh, you know, I, I just read uh, over the weekend. I think that Saudi Arabia has declared intentions to become uh, uh, 
carbon a carbon neutral country. I mean, that's that is if they are seriously backing that, then that's that's an amazing uh, amazing statement of ambition. So I, I I think this is something which is becoming less and less escapable. Uh, and so for us, I think we are really informed by what our customer base is beginning to consider important. And then and then the other way is that I think it's a good opportunity for us to both use our our the the, the, the scale and the scope of our network to get messages out, to show a good example. And, and of course, I mean, the thing which, which, which is a completely separate conversation is the use of technology uh, in order to uh, enable and to facilitate more sustainable practices. Uh, I mean, I mean, we can speak about that a little bit later, but I think, I think that's, that's where we stand. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. So now uh, we turn to the financer in our panel. Uh, so if I can invite Raja Ame to share his thoughts as well. Thank you, Firoz. Uh, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum, Dato Azmi, Dato Kamal. Uh, pleasure to be on the same panel as uh, such distinguished uh, corporate leaders. Um, so, Firoz, I, you know, I'll just walk through. Uh, I've, we've got some slides that uh, we we have prepared just uh, as an introduction. Um, and you know, I'll just walk through very briefly in terms of uh, HSBC Amana as well as HSBC Group's uh, overall climate ambition. So if I can just start with the first slide, uh, which walks through HSBC Group's uh, own ambition. Okay, so essentially we've, uh, we've committed to be net zero uh, by 2050 in terms of our financing portfolio and uh, net zero in our own supply chain by 2030 or sooner. And you know, the, this strategy prong is really across three, um, three initiatives, which I'll walk through very quickly. So the first is becoming a net zero bank overall, uh, as mentioned 2050 or sooner in our own portfolio. So now we are you know, looking at the kind of uh, financings that we are undertaking with a view to, you know, to, to reduce that uh, and eliminate coal in, entirely um, by 2050. Um, we're aligning the book with also commitments that's been made both at a national and global level in terms of the Paris agreements. Um, there is an intention to make regular non-financial disclosure in the form of TCFD, uh, which HSBC Amana has done this year, uh, the first by any financial institution uh, in Malaysia and only the second in HSBC group altogether. Um, you know, we're looking to collaborate with uh, stakeholders to develop uh, a global standard because as you can see, and as you would know, you know, there's various standards when it comes to something as simple as uh, ESG, sustainable labor practices and so on. And as mentioned in our supply chain by 2030 or sooner. So that's the bank as a whole. Now, how do we translate that to customers? So you know, we, have a, we have a dedicated unit, um, which is an ESG unit based in Hong Kong. Um, I'm building one team uh, in Malaysia as well, uh, which will be able to support specifically in, relate, uh, in relation to Malaysia-based transactions. Um, as a group, we have committed up to 1 trillion uh, of financing and investment over the next 10 years to support this transition. Um, and then we also are applying a climate lens to our financing decisions, which I'll talk to you about in the on-swing slide as well. And then just, you know, finally, in terms of at the group level, in terms of unlocking uh, climate solutions, we are working with, you know, clean tech investment. And that, that is also as demonstrated by our recent partnership in Singapore with Tomasic. Uh, so we've got 100 million clean tech investment fund. We've also got another 100 million philanthropic uh, program in place as well. And generally, we're looking at sustainable infrastructure uh, into the, as a global asset class as we create a pipeline of bankable projects across the, across the globe. Now, if I can just bring this home uh, to HSBC Amana Malaysia in the next slide. So overview of Project Cocoon. Um, Project Cocoon is, is, is a code name we use internally. Um, and it's something that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a 24 month highly ambitious plan um, some say audacious, in fact, where we are, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to convert our Malaysia specific operations, HSBC Amana, into a fully sustainable bank by 2022. Now, when we had this discussion with our group office, it was at that Malaysia would be the pilot for this exercise, given that, you know, Islamic banking um, very much resonates with uh, ESG as well. So therefore, it's, it was, you know, deemed as the apt platform to do that. Now, what does a fully sustainable entity mean, or rather, how is it measured? So what we have taken as a, as a, as a benchmark of measure is our financing portfolio. And we are undertaking an exercise where we will be classifying our portfolio to be in compliance with the triple bottom line as, uh, as published by Bank Negara under value-based intermediation. So looking at people, prosperity, and planet. 
and 51% of our portfolio needs to be aligned with that by the end of 2022, which is what we are currently doing uh, under Project Cocoon. So the purpose, and this is a revised uh, mission statement that was coined actually at uh, Taman Nagara, uh, you know, a few years back when, you know, employees were asked, you know, what, 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 what does the purpose of the institution mean to you? And, you know, so it came back that um, as, as, you know, from the employees upwards, it means that enabling sustainable growth to achieve a shared value within the communities we serve and the environment we live in, not only today, but also tomorrow. So within this triple bottom line, as mentioned, there's a long term, uh, which is people's prosperity, um, you know, the people aspect looking at social change and impact, and finally on the planet, uh, climate change, as well as impact. Okay, so that's, uh, that's Project Cocoon, which is, a, you know, which is a 24 month uh, program we're currently underway. And if I can just move to the final slide to talk through some of you know, the products we've launched, um, some of the external memberships we've done and some, you know, very quickly on the awards that uh, we've been, um, you know, honored to have received. So within the products and deals, uh, 2018, I'll go back to 2018 because that's when we launched um, the, you know, the revised mission statement. Uh, we issued uh, the world's first uh, UN SDG Sukuk by a financial institution. Uh, that was 500 million ringgit. You know, up to today, I'm still monitoring the allocation of um, how that uh, has, you know, how, how the use of proceeds are being tagged. Um, in 2019, we launched an ESG Islamic structured product. Uh, there's more in that space this year, inshallah. And in 2020, we acted as a sole sustainability structuring bank for a sustainability linked financing for an oil and gas player, Yinsen Holdings. So that was, um, you know, together with the Axiata, that was uh, one of the uh, only, if not the first, um, sustainability link financing transaction, which was done as a, as a financing facility in Malaysia. And we're very proud to uh, inform that we've also today just announced a sustainability link Sukuk as well for Yinsen, uh, which is uh, which has a second party opinion by ISS, which is an international uh, second party opinion provider. And it has very three ambitious KPIs in place. Um, this year, we also uh, were honoured uh, to act as the SDG Joint SDG Advisor for the Government of Malaysia's inaugural 800 million sustainability SOKO. Um, we've also launched our TCFD, as mentioned, and uh, we've done a green financing for Guanchong Coco, which was the first green sustainability financing in the supply chain. Now, in terms of our external advocacy, um, we're one of the five uh, founding members of uh, BNM's VBI. Uh, we are chairing the subcommittee four uh, from the JC3 with Bank Nagara on capacity building, which will be engaging with a lot of the industry players uh, as we aim to roll out the, finance, uh, the programs for next year. And we're the first international bank in Malaysia proudly to be part of the UNGC, which is the United Nations Global Compact. Um, and to that effect, we've made our, you know, our first uh, statement of uh, communications of progress this year, uh, as well as uh, the TCFD has mentioned. So that's uh, just some of the things that we're doing and cooking at our plate, uh, Feroz, and happy to take any further questions on that. Thank you, uh, Raja Ame. Uh, just, just a follow-up question um, relating to your TCFD. So we all know HSBC Amana become the first bank in Malaysia uh, to publish your TCFD report. Uh, and and you, you also aim to be you know, the group's first sustainable banking entity by the end of 2022. Now, is that timeline still on track? And uh, what are some of the key uh, elements of ESG incorporated uh, into your operations to achieve that target? Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, so the pressure is definitely on Firoz on my side to deliver that by end of 2022, no doubt about that. You know, so that's uh, full on at the moment. Um, we're proud to say that, you know, inshallah, as at uh, October 25th or October today's date, um, we're very, very much in terms of achieving that, um, that allocation. Um, so, you know, in terms of um, the progress, right, so I mean, I just need to so, sort of digress a bit because, you know, I always... Um, I need to tell people that this is not a green instrument, right? Because, you know, when, when we do a green Sukuk or, a, or a, you know, a sustainability Sukuk, it's very much, you have to very much tie it to the eligible use of proceeds as set out in the various guidelines. Now, when it comes to people prosperity in the planet, I mean, there's not really a globally defined, um, uh, you know, um, definition of what exactly that is. But if you just look at our financing portfolio, right? So our financing portfolio is, um, you know, is about 13 billion um, as at, uh, uh, that's HSBC Amana, 13 billion as at September. And um, it's roughly, you know, skewed 60% uh, towards uh, the retail book and 40% 
towards the wholesale book, which is global banking and commercial banking. So one of the first tasks that, you know, that when I came in, I started to, you know, we, we started to think about, okay, how are we going to cut this up, right? Because, you know, obviously, if, if it comes to a, a company, for example, um, you know, it's much easier to say that this company is ESG compliant, if and, you know, if it meets certain uh, parameters. And again, you know, we don't, we don't crunch the, that data, we, there are data providers uh, who do that, so we can reference it to them. To them. Um, but when it comes to a retail client, like if we have, a, you know, when I say financing the retail book, I'm talking about mortgage loans, I'm talking about personal financing, as well as credit card. So how, you know, the some of the big uh, steps was taken in getting a definition which, you know, which is fair enough to, to encapsulate uh, the definition of that. So we've looked at, you know, basically B50, uh, that's the latest definition which has come up, you know, what, what percentage of our book is exposed to B50? Um, you know, who's buying a house for the first time, for example, even if you're M40 or T20, if, you know, if it's buying a house for the first time, um, you know, we should see that as, as increasing home ownership. And then we're also looking at things um, like what was the use of proceeds for that personal financing? Can we align it with any um, social cause or any UN SDG? Did they buy, you know, did they essentially do it for refurbishment of their clinic? Did they use the money for education? Things like this. So it's, it's quite an ambitious exercise where, you know, that data is not, not readily available. It requires a lot of manual extraction uh, right. to see where, yeah, where that information is and, uh, and align it accordingly. And, um, and we are also looking at, you know, the Bank Negara CCPT, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, VBI as well as to ensure that our framework is as robust and in incorporates as much information as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Rajame. Okay, let's let's move on to questions from the floor and I open this up to all uh, panelists. There seem to be a number of questions around uh, SMEs and, uh, and supply chains, right? Uh, so a question posed by Hafiz, right? Uh, so significant portion of the economy is contributed by SMEs and of course your suppliers. So how, in your opinions, uh, how can how can SMEs uh, be also onboarded towards the ESG agenda uh, you know, within their business model, especially in a recovering economy where everyone is cost sensitive uh, and, and perhaps also maybe some thoughts in terms of, you know, um, should the regulators introduce a kind of carrot stick to get everybody on board PLCs and SMEs as well. Uh, if I could invite anyone to share their thoughts. Maybe, maybe I'll start first, yeah, right. So sure. uh, I, I think it's, uh, number one, if you're talking about SME, right, uh, You've, you've got to see where this is going. Uh, and, and anything today, uh, let's be honest. Uh, you know, sustainability, unfortunately, comes at a cost. Uh, I do think in future, we will reach parity that the cost of substitute by, by getting more sustainable materials, we will reach parity. And then we'll look at it being cheaper over time. <clears throat> and that's where, you know, it should move. Uh, but if you look at SME, I think you've got to look at industry. And if you look at industry, I think one thing that we, we need to understand is that where is the industry going? Can, we need to be guided before we make investments. So if we have a clear policy that tells us, hey, this is, this is the direction, for example. Let's take automotive industry as an example. This is the direction for automotive industry. You, you, you can bring in uh, EVs, electric vehicle. This will be the, the you know the kind of expectations in, in years to come, and these are the incentives. I think when there is that clarity, then it is wise to make the investment. The problem we face is that if you if you then invest, and, and that investment comes as an additional cost, and you have players that do not, then you are making yourselves uncompetitive. And I, I think that's the danger today, right? Of course, we want to. I think we for those who can and, and would, I think that's great. Um, and you should, but I think we need, to, we need to have policies that will square off those people who do invest in sustainability and those who don't, so that you know, the playing field is level. Thank you, Dr. Azmir. Um, how about Raja Amir, Dr. Kamal, any comments on that? Uh, Dr. Kamal, would you like to go first or? Uh, not really. I, I'd like to hear your answer then. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, no, I, I think I, I, I broadly agree with Dr. Azmi. I think, I think when, when you speak about SMEs, it, uh, especially at a time like this when the economy is emerging from, from a long traumatic period, 
um, I think uh, cost sensitivity is probably the biggest consideration for them. Um, I, I would I have I have a couple of quite unstructured thoughts about this. I think first of all is that uh, you actually look should look at the 8020 rule. So you should look really at the larger um, the, the larger organizations and, and entities I think uh, that have a larger uh, carbon footprint uh, and try to encourage them to become or not encourage actually. I, I think I think they, they should be they should be compelled to be more sustainable, uh, certainly. Um, that's one. Number two is I think uh, regulation plays a very big part in this, uh, but you know, uh, again, we have to be realistic. I think we've seen in other countries, like in France, for example, where they've tried to push a uh, sustainability agenda a bit more aggressively. There's huge, huge pushback, uh, and, and we know around the world where economies are um, where our economies are dependent, for example, on on extraction and extractive industries and fossil fuels. It is political suicide to, to introduce anything which runs against that. Um, so it's great on paper and in theory, uh, but in, in reality, you're always going to um, face challenges. Um, but regulation is a way to go, really, uh, because regulation above all else uh, shapes uh, behavior. I think you know before this, uh, none of us would be seen uh, walking around wearing masks uh, out in public, but because of current circumstances and because of regulation, uh, I think uh, you know uh, some of that takes hold, um, and then uh, and then and then thirdly, I think uh, uh, aligned to regulation. I think along with the stick, I think there needs to be a carrot as well. So I think there needs to be a, a raft of uh, incentives to try and persuade people uh, to move over uh, to, mm -hmm. um, uh, to to more sustainable practices. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I mean even among larger corporations uh, such as the ones that the three of us represent. Uh, I think there's always going to be a debate about the cost uh, of of becoming greener and more sustainable, uh, and whether there's a sufficient payoff. I think in some areas you can already um, you can already uh, uh, prove uh, that moving, for example, to greater efficiency, uh, to less wastage, um, it actually does pay off uh, over over a reasonably short period in, in mm. some areas. Um, but I think. I think more of that needs to be done. I, unfortunately, I don't think we can rely purely on uh, on um, on on a recognition that it is the right thing to do. I think there needs to be some kind of imperative, uh, either financial or regulatory. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. Uh, Raja Amir, your thoughts? Yeah, just to just to chip in, I think um, from you know as from the regulator perspective, you know, I mean, a lot of discussions have been had with the the regulator of how do we, you know, how do we guide these SMEs or SMEs out of the the pandemic situation. So a lot of focus is being put on them because they're obviously the backbone of the economy. You know, they employ a large number of Malaysians. So definitely, um, whether it's not whether it's I mean whether it's sustainability alone or whether it's just programs being put in place to um, to encourage SM, encourage financing to SMEs, that's definitely uh, in, in the in the works. But if we specifically zone into is sustainability important for SMEs? Yes, there is a cost consideration, and trust me, this has been raised at various forums. Um, a second party review is very expensive. Um, you know, things we, we've been talking about tax incentives. We've been talking about even to the extent of providing training. You know, training funds. Bank Negara has a training fund. You know, we're, we're even talking about um, you know essentially you know what can we do to support SMEs in this chain. Um, what, what I can say is that, you know, those SMEs who do start to engage earlier will definitely have a, a you know, first mover advantage against others. You know, even within the global supply chain of things, I mean, we're seeing Nestle, you know, we're seeing a lot of the uh, global MNCs who will also be going down to, you know, their supply chain to see who is, who is supplying them and what is their carbon commitment. So definitely whilst uh, I think, you um, and you know, when we look at the financial institutions who are going to need to report uh, on their exposure to climate risk in 2022 on, on based on their first half exposure, so this is coming out already. Bank Negara is rolling it out. You know, we banks don't really have a choice but to take that whole financing lens into what you know what is the uh, carbon emissions of our clients because we are going to need to report that by the first half of 2022 already so and, and i saw there's one question just you know in terms of plcs i mean the carrot and the stick approach is you know it's it's been discussed at length and it is i think the regulate in on the regulator's mind to implement more of a carrot 
uh, as opposed to a stick, especially in the early days where we do this orderly transition into a you know low carbon economy, and. Um, you know, I'm sorry, not to advertise, but I mean, even within HSBC, we have a mid-market accelerator program where we are educating SMEs on, you know, how it is important to incorporate uh, these elements into your business because in the long run, capital is going to be skewed towards um, companies who are, you know, top of the ESG chain. Right. So just, just picking up on the discussion, especially, you know, uh, Dr. Azmi is input about, you know, sustainability is not... It's not cheap, let's put it that way. And, and that'll come out as, you know, a certain pushback may happen if, uh, if the situation is not correct to accept certain sustainability uh, decisions, right? So how, how, are, how are you as leaders in your organization creating and driving a sustainability culture within your people, right? So that despite your organizations being a, a trailblazer and sometimes, you know, taking the risk of running this, this lost lead positions in, in ESG practices, uh, that people are still proactive and want to contribute uh, uh, positively towards your ESG uh, agenda. From a culture perspective, would you like to share some thoughts? Yeah, again, I'll, I'll go first so the you know, Kamal can listen to my answer, right? <laughs> uh, so no, uh, look, uh, I think you know to be to to be uh, the honest truth is that the days of you know just extracting as much profit as possible is is is, is done, right? I think the investment community now demands more from companies, and I, I think if you know if you don't if you don't uh, you know look at a triple bottom line is what Raja Ame put up just now, I, I, then you uh, no company will be regarded as a serious company, you know, and uh, you know investors will like, and so that I think is a evolving demand. I think that's a really positive evolution, and that's going to happen, and it's going to become more and more apparent. So I think every company has to have you know, a, a triple bottom line, has to have a social uh, economic agenda. And it's just not about making profit. So that's, that's I think, you know, the way it's going, right? Uh, I think the second point is that uh, at the core of each company, all of us, I think, need to decide what do we want to do? Um, and how fast are we going to do it? Right? For Sime Darby property, I think you know, what, what, we, what we did was first to get this alignment at the top of the house so that we, we all understand, hey, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to reach uh, carbon negative or carbon neutral at a certain date. So we've, we've, we're working on that. Uh, I mean, we, we, we haven't announced it, but I, I hope we can do that soon. And, and by, by, by doing that, I think, you know, we, that organization will just move in that direction. I think once you get, you know, clear direction uh, and, and, you, and you explain and you articulate, I, I think you, you, when, I, when I talk to the guys in the, in the organization about, you know, ESG and specifically about environment and such, everybody wants to get in the bandwagon. Everybody's just looking for direction. How, yes, how do we do this? Mm. Right, so I think that's 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 a great great thing, and that has to be the direction for for large companies, and basically that that's the responsible thing to do. Thank you, Dr. Azmi. Uh, Dr. Kamal. Yeah, I, you know my answer to that would be it's it's a slightly it's a slightly nebulous woolly answer, but I think it is necessary. I think it's uh, it's a question of actually aligning profits with purpose. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Salcom is part of the Agjata group. The Agjata groups uh, were fortunate enough, actually, to be part of an enlightened uh, uh, parent, uh, which Agjata has got this four P principles. Uh, it's uh, beyond short term profits, uh, educating people, uh, process excellence, and um, what was the last one? Planet and society, right? So that's the four P's. At Salcom, we've got this thing called the Salcom Compass which is supposed to be a blend between uh, uh, giving direction to make the company more profitable, but, uh, but developing it into a company that has a soul. Uh, so I, I, think, uh, I think the number one thing is, is, that, uh, is that beyond just pure profit orientation, I think companies uh, probably need to have a broader purpose uh, and, a, and a greater appreciation of its position and its role within society. Um, which actually I think is reflective of the, the people who want to work for it. Uh, I, I think if you, if you offer, uh, um, I'm mindful, of, by the way, that there is a banker on the panel. 
but I, I'm sure that that I think from from Rajami's uh, perspective, I think if you were just to offer a fantastic remuneration package, I think that goes only so far. If that's married to something which is more meaningful uh, and and uh, and uh, a little bit more profound than just dollars and cents, then I think you get a better quality of people working for you, frankly. Uh, so I, I, I would I, I would start there. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. Raja Amin, thoughts? No, I mean just uh, I mean just to just to uh, chip in on that one. I mean it's it's case in point. I mean if I can just give an example of uh, you know some of the the people who have joined us in the past few months and you know specifically to what Dr. Kamal mentioned is that you know there was one I mean there's one employee in particular who came from a very reputable organization, you know spent many years there, um, and he was drawn to the fact that um, you know even though where he was was a very senior position he was drawn to join us in our endeavor because he feels that you know he's basically being able to add more value to a cause that resonates with him so it's the, the part about inculcation of the value you know it's 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 uh, it's really what the people are feeling i mean obviously there's many things that is going through their mind but when we open up these forums to people you know staff uh, what are your contributions what are your thoughts I mean, the feedback is sometimes they want to do more than what we're actually willing to do at this juncture. Like, you know, they're, they're willing to go over and beyond. So it's really a topic of mind. Um, and I think, you know, people are very much, um, you know, I think this is a heightened state of consciousness that we're going through now. And a lot of people would say it's a buzzword, you know, it's, it's, it's a theme of the moment, but, you know, really beyond that, I think it's, it, it's what people have really wanted to do, i.e., you know, to, to, to basically, it's not just about profit, it's not just about working, it's, it's about building a better future together. So I think in that respect, it's not such a difficult uh, topic to inculcate, in, at least in, in, you know, some organizations, because people very much resonate with it. Thank you, Rajami. So we, I see you have one minute left on the clock. Now, this being Malaysia Climate Action Week, I'd like to end the panel by asking each of the panelists a very quick 30-second uh, advice to our, to our audience, right? Climate action, how they can do it, how to start, how, how let's go. What's your advice to them? So perhaps, Rajami, you will... You, okay, Dato' Kama, since you volunteer, you go first. Right, okay. Yeah. So, so my advice is start now. Start now and do something. Because I think everybody needs it. This is a problem that needs to be solved by everybody, not just by certain people or certain parts of society. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. Uh, Rajami? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, I've seen some of the questions on the, on the Q&A and I, you know, apologize, we can't answer all of them, but, you know, really, um, the, it, it, this, the time is now, you know, I mean, we're, we're in that moment where it's a transition phase. So whether we like it or not, um, you know, companies are going to need to start putting disclosure. I mean, even the corporate governance guidelines already says that, you know, senior PLC, um, you know, uh, management are going to be remunerated according to the ESG commitments. So it's really, you know, we're at that uh, stage where um, it's 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 moving from infancy to something a bit more mainstream. You know, please do reach out to us. You know, we were willing to have those conversations. We want to be contributing towards the economy and we're willing to help you as much as possible in this early days of transition for you. Thank you, Raja Azmir. So over to you, Dr. Azmir, to wrap up our panel. Yeah, ahead, I, anyway, we simply put, uh, for us, uh, you know, we need, what you can do, I think, really to help is, is to get the organization to come up with a goal, right? And, and I think when organizations decide that they're going to do something, it gets very powerful. And the power of all the organization and, 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 translate and, and the ability to do good is actually tremendous. So if an organization today decides, say, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to have X target, I'm going to have, have carbon neutral target, whatever. You know, you get the agreement done, commit to a date, and you will mobilize. I think that's the most powerful thing, the simplest thing. Commit to a date, commit to a goal, and you know, go ahead and do it. There's no better time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asme. So uh, to the audience, please join me for a virtual applause uh, for three distinguished panelists for sharing some great insights uh, and also advice, right? So definitely, I think everybody on this call will have to start something around your climate agenda. Again, thank you. Uh, over to you, Jen. Thank you, Faros. Thank you to our panelists, Raja Azmir, Dato Azmir, Dato Kamal, for an excellent panel session. Uh, good takeaways for all companies, big or small. Start now. The time is now. Organizations set a goal, commit to a date, and mobilize. That's the key, me the last parting words from our panelists. So that brings us to the end of our first webinar for our Malaysia Climate Action Week. 
But before we close for the afternoon, I would like to encourage all of you to complete our feedback form, which is in your chat box now. Your views are important to us. I also like to take an opportunity to highlight tomorrow's session, which will feature a forum on how climate governance is shaping corporations around the world. Our speakers will include Tan Sri, Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar, the chairman of Bursa Malaysia, Mr. Yi Yang Cheng, the president, group CEO of MIC Group, Ariana Kok from EY, and Mr. Ralph Dixon from YTL. The session will be moderated by Datin Sunita Rajakumar, founder of Climate Governance Malaysia. In addition, as our panelists said, the time is now. We invite organizations to sign up to the BMCC Climate Action Pledge. The pledge will be launched in support from the British High Com and UNGC. For organizations that have not started your climate action journey, a pledge is a small step to take forward and let us guide you systematically towards fulfilling your climate action goal. A small step can lead to big changes. And for organizations that are already taking climate action initiatives, join us as our panelists today to be industry advocate and influence more organizations to take action to combat climate change. So please support the pledge. For more information on the pledge, you may visit climateactionweek.bmcc.org.my. With that, thank you once again to all our speakers for today's webinar. Our appreciation to our Climate Action Partner, HSBC, for co-organizing this webinar, as well for all the supporting organizations for helping us promote Climate Action Week Malaysia to your network. That brings us to close of day one of our Malaysia Climate Action Week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to the panelists again. Hope all the audience found the session for today insightful. Have a great evening and we look forward to you joining us tomorrow. Thank you and bye.